Today we're speaking with Professor Susan Davis. She's a leading researcher in the field of endocrinology and women's health, with particular focus on the role of testosterone and oestrogen in cognition, mood, sexual function, the cardiovascular system and other tissues. Surprisingly, testosterone prescription for women is quite widespread, not just in Australia, but all over the world. And there's never been any guidance, clear global guidance, as to who merits therapy, what tests should be done before treatment's given, um, how long should you treat, what should you treat with, and what are the benefits and risks, the side effects. So the global position statement was supported by major societies around the world. The International Menopause Society led it, and it was supported by the Royal College of ONG from UK, Endocrine Society, American College of ONG, and so on and so forth. And it had no pharmaceutical funding. And we met together in Berlin and had a day workshop and from this, we developed this position statement that's been signed off by over 11 international societies and been made available in 14 languages. And it's on the International Menopause Society website for anybody to access and was published in four journals. And so it's important because it is a harmonised international guidance. So what we're recommending for doctors in Australia is the same that's being recommended in Europe, America, South America. And it is a very clear guideline for people to practice in. HSDD is a technical term, but we really use it to describe low sexual desire experienced by a woman that is causing her personal distress. It's interfering with her mood, her well-being, her emotions, her relationships, however it affects her personally. Now this is a diagnosis that is made after excluding other causative factors. So patient comes to see me, she's come to see me because of low desire. My job is to work out, is this an independent entity or is this a consequence of a bad relationship, um, sexual discomfort, so therefore sexual aversion? Is she depressed, anxious, personal stress? Is there a history of physical, sexual or emotional abuse? What is causing the problem? And the other very important thing is, is it recent or is it lifelong? I mean, if it's lifelong that a woman's never had sexual interest and never had arousal or orgasm, you are not going to fix this by giving her a medication. This requires um, psychotherapy, et cetera, and sorting out all the issues. So it's really important to do a full medical history, sexual history, psychosocial history, and indeed an examination to work out, is there any other cause? And if no other clear cause is found, then we would then distinguish the woman as having low desire with distress that's independent of other factors. With a caveat, women will often present with a relationship issue and the detective work is trying to ascertain how much of the relationship issue is a consequence of the change in the woman causing disharmony in the relationship rather than the relationship being the primary problem. So there's a lot of things to unpick, isn't there, in this consultation? It's It can be a complex consultation, depends how insightful the the particular patient is. And so often in, in the context of general practice, if the woman brings this up, or in fact I would suggest with all postmenopausal women, the question should be asked, are you sexually active? Do you have any sexual concerns? Is this something you would like to talk about? So introduce the topic. If this opens Pandora's box, then say, well, I can see this is important for you I would like you to come back and talk to me with a longer consultation and make the time to talk about it properly. Because it's quite common for women to not bring up conditions like this, really personal conditions, but if asked, they will provide information. I think that's probably quite common, isn't it? So we know that from our um, study in Australia, one in three women 
at midlife experiences low desire associated with distress. Not necessarily HSDD because there may be other causative factors. But it is really important in a consultation to ask the question. And you can, as I say, use very open-ended questions. The first would be, are you sexually active? And are you concerned about that? Do you have any concerns? Now, I would like to highlight that if a woman says, no, I'm not, that's not the end of the conversation because she may not be sexually active because she has low desire and would love to talk to you about it. But if you don't ask her the question, she's not going to. The second thing would be, don't assume because a woman doesn't have a partner, she's not experiencing this. A lot of older women have casual partners, so you may not know about them. She may tell you she's unpartnered, or she may wish to be partnered, and this is a problem. And then the third thing is, just because a woman's older, do not assume it's not an issue. 15% of women aged 65 to 80 experience low desire with stress, and you should ask them the same questions. We looked at this extensively in the Global Position Statement based on a systematic review and measure analysis that was done before that, that we published um, in Lancet Diabetes and Endo. And it showed very clearly that the benefit based on evidence available to date is limited to postmenopausal women experiencing HSDD. It has not been shown to be effective for premenopausal women. Subsequent large studies may indeed show that to be the case, but the available evidence is not there. And it is not of benefit for any other condition or to prevent any other disease or condition. So it shouldn't be prescribed for depression. It shouldn't be to prescribed to prevent breast cancer, as though, although some people are doing this. It is only being shown to be useful for low desire with distress. So this is a clinical diagnosis, it's not a biochemical diagnosis, so we do not use a blood testosterone level to make the diagnosis. However, a level of blood testosterone should be taken, and we always recommend taking that with sex hormone binding globulin, to just be sure that you do not have a patient with a surprisingly high level that you may be uncomfortable prescribing testosterone for. So a high normal would be a concern. Um, why didn't we measure SHBG? It's because sex hormone binding globulin. It's because we know that women with high levels are very unlikely to respond to testosterone therapy. And that's been shown in clinical trials. So it's a guidance of precaution. And then you should always continue to measure testosterone levels frequently once you've prescribed testosterone for women. How often? So after prescribing testosterone initially, I would always re um, recommend doing a blood level after about three weeks. The patient will not experience the improvement for several weeks, but at three weeks you've reached blood level steady state. So you can check that the patient's not overusing it. So rather than the patient come back in 10 or 12 weeks with oily skin and saying, I'm getting some pimples because she's using too much, you can check the level at three weeks get the result, call the patient and say, I'd like you to lower your dose. And then once you've reviewed the patient, we usually review patients at about 12 weeks, then you should at least measure the level every six months as long as treatment continues. If the patient has experienced no benefit by six months, discontinue therapy because it's unlikely any, any benefit will be achieved after that. There's no limit as to how long a woman may continue to use testosterone therapy. 
But the critical issue is that you don't just prescribe a whole lot of repeat prescriptions and the woman goes off to the sunset. As long as she is continuing to use the, the testosterone, you must continue to review her both clinically and biochemically. As long as you're prescribing testosterone that's been developed specifically for use in women, no. Um, I would highlight that the TGA have now approved a particular testosterone formulation for women and therefore there is absolutely no justification in Australia for prescribing either a male formulation or a compounded formulation because a formulation specifically for women is available. And that is what should be used. And if that is used, there are no specific contraindications other than I would say, if a woman has, for example, a hormone dependent cancer, like breast cancer, I would not be prescribing it without consulting with her oncologist or any other major health conditions. And, and I, I think that really goes for everything. Most of us would not prescribe any therapy for women with major health conditions, particularly hormone therapy, without consulting with the other treating specialists, say people with severe liver disease or renal disease. Even as an endocrinologist, I would consult with, their, with my colleague specialists because the last thing you want is the patient going back to their specialist and the specialist saying, oh, you should never be on that. And then the poor patients submit in the sandwich. Although estrogen drops precipitously at menopause, it is not the cause of HSDD. What you need to consider for your patients is whether they've got vaginal atrophy symptoms causing them withdrawal from sexual function or loss of interest in sex and treat the vaginal atrophy symptoms with estrogen. If women are having hot flushes, night sweats, anxiety, mood disturbances, sleep deprivation, treat that with estrogen. So if a postmenopausal woman comes to see you and she's got the whole box and dice of symptoms and HSDD, I would treat her, I would say possible HSDD, I would treat her to alleviate the hot flushes, the night sweats and or vaginal dryness before even considering testosterone because the low libido may go away because she's slept more and feels better and the vaginal symptoms have gone. And in fact, that she never really had HSDD. But estrogen does not treat HSDD. And Presently, even globally, there is no treatment that has ever been shown to be as effective as testosterone for women, particularly for HSDD. There is now an approved TGA product for testosterone for women. Um, there are specific prescribing in information available with that product. And if you, um, I'm not advertising this product, so I'm not going to give particular information. But if you use the specified guidelines that will be um, provided by the, TA, uh, the TGA, um, it's prescribed, you check the blood levels in three weeks, you review the patient at 12 weeks. Why 12 weeks? Well, we know that transdermal testosterone therapy has a, an effect after about four to six weeks. I used to bring patients back at four to six weeks and then they'd say, oh, my partner's been unwell or the dog died or something else has happened so I don't really know if I'm feeling better or you know, my mother-in-law's been really sick. And so I leave it for 12 weeks because if there have been any intervening complications in the person's life, it gives them 
a fairly reasonable time to ascertain whether they feel that there's been a benefit. There's no blood test that's going to tell you it's a benefit. The benefit is determined by the woman. And then people sort of worry about, oh, but women will be using it if they don't need it. I can tell you, women will tell you if it's not working, and women do not want to take a therapy that doesn't work. So I can assure you that women will lead you through the benefits or the side effects if they're using too much. We do need to understand the areas of um, potential benefit of testosterone for women. It is a normal female hormone. The levels decline with age. We don't really understand exactly why, but we need to understand whether there is or is not a benefit for things like bone health. We also need to understand whether there may be a benefit for premenopausal women in the late reproductive years. So we have shown that testosterone levels decline by about 25% between the ages of 20 and 40. There is some evidence suggest to suggest that testosterone may improve fertility in women that are poor responders to infertility treatments. It is being incorporated into some IVF programs, but not strongly evidence-based. What is the role of replacement in women with early menopause? And then to really confuse people, we have found in our more recent studies that women over the age of 70 have testosterone levels similar to 20-year-olds. And that's from blood levels down in 7,000 women aged 70 to 94. So there seems to be a decline with age before menopause a flattening of the curve across menopause, and then from about the age of 65 onwards, an increase. And we don't know why, and we don't know if there may be a survival advantage for older women having higher testosterone. So that's research we're doing now. Fascinating. If your patient doesn't talk about sexual function, when you're doing a well woman's health check, because I know many women go and have annual blood tests and they have their pap smears, although it's every five years, or they might come for a breast check, just bring into the conversation, you know, so are you sexually active? Ask them about vaginal dryness. Six percent of postmenopausal women use vaginal estrogen whereas over 50% of postmenopausal women have vaginal dryness and atrophy. So ask them about it. Ask them if they have any sexual concerns and if they close the topic down, fine, you've done your bit. But if they open up the topic, then give them the chance to talk about their concerns. Great. Thanks so much, Sue. Thank you.